Hey, good morning. Good morning. Nice to see you. In case you missed it, the mask mandate was lifted by the university. Of course, if you want to continue to wear the mask, it's your choice. It's completely all right. Today, I'm going to show you the additions and changes I made to the class wiki, show you a couple of announcements, and then, as we do usually on a Wednesday, we're going to talk about a Machiavellian book, which is also, like Robert Greene's 48 Laws of Power, one of the books listed in the page about ideas for the paper, because it is one of those books that you can choose for your final project. So keep in mind that what we do on a Wednesday, a kind of discussion and analysis, comparing a text, its ideas, to the actual ideas of Machiavelli, examining what interpretations or even distortions, re-readings have been made of Machiavelli's pages from the prints and ideas in general, is conducive to the kind of work that you will be required to undertake for the paper. So the paper will be the demonstration that you've learned from these Wednesday's classes, as well as Monday's classes, because when you write the paper about a Machiavellian book, you will be required to include specific references to Machiavelli's ideas, passages, etc., instead of a generic kind of work. Okay? So, this is the current week, week six, and as you see, I've added a link to a PDF which resides on a Google Drive and requires your Stony Brook login to access, and that would be the introduction, the first 20 pages, but they're small pages, it's all together about 5,000 words only, from Harriet Rubin, The Princess uh, Machiavelli for Women, 1998, which uh, the book actually was published in 1997, and so we're about the same time as The 48 Laws of Power, and then the book sold well, not as well as The 48 Laws of Power, and it was not the kind of long sell that 48 Laws of Power enjoyed, the 48 Laws of Power still being sold, whereas, yes, you can still get this book, but, for example, even the fact that you can only get this book in print, there is no electronic edition, means that the publisher has dropped the ball on this, has, has forgotten about it, otherwise they would have refreshed it with an electronic edition, the investment, their commitment, their financial commitment would have been minimal. It is an interesting book. It is an interesting author. Um, on Friday, of course, we will uh, complete our uh, view of the God scenes from The Godfather, and I will spend more time compared to last week with, the, with my analysis of the Machiavellian elements in that particular film. Next week, as you can see, I've added more information about week seven. Next week, we will look, we will watch scenes from the talented Mr. Ripley, still from the 1990s with Matt Damon, etc. Under week seven, I've added as a reading, as an assigned required reading, these excerpts from Harriet Rubin. Of course, as I said, if you opt to complete your paper on this book, get a copy from the library. A lot of local libraries have this book or order a copy from Amazon or a used copy from Eight Books. It's not very expensive. It's about $15, I believe the paper book back uh, edition. I also added, under week seven, more excerpts from the same book we use for Little Caesar, American Gangster Cinema, and of course, I added 
Again, just a few pages, the section about the Godfather trilogy, not just the first film, but the others as well. A reminder also that this week is the deadline for the second written assignment, which you find under week four, is it? See, week four, exactly. So don't forget, under week four, you find the instructions for this assignment based on the four day laws of power. And again, the purpose of the assignment is to introduce the kind of analysis and discussion that you would be doing on a larger scale in a more comprehensive fashion for your paper. So it allows me to give you positive feedback or feedback that would allow you to realign yourselves uh, onto the parameters of uh, the class and the focus that we bring into the class. Okay, and I've tried to do the same with the first assignment, and, and by yesterday I uh, completed the correction, the review of the first assignment, and left my grade, my comments, so if you haven't seen them yet, open the Google Docs file you will share, you have shared with me and look for my comments and the grade there. And of course, feel free to email me or leave another comment there and reply to my comments with questions if you want clarification, if my comments are not clear or you disagree, etc. And one of the things that I try to insist to emphasize was be specific. Apply the specific schema, the matrix that we introduced in class. Don't rely on internet searches because of course the few students who did that, for example, it's an obsession of students, high school, American high school students, and then you bring it along on a campus to start a paper on an assignment with a definition. Oh, oh my God, brilliant, right? What is the problem with that? That definitions are biased, are placed within an intellectual framework. In the case of Machiavellian, if you go look for the term Machiavellian on the internet, more often than not, you find the red pill definition. Mm -hmm. The uh, definition that mentions the triads, the qualities of uh, the pickup artist, of the uh, womanizer, or the pathological social player. And there is a literature, a psychological literature about Machiavellianism in that sense. For us, it's just something that we know about, but we pursue another line of reasoning and analysis for what it means to be Machiavellian, which is to say, how can we define something as authentically or partially Machiavellian based on our interpretation and understanding of the prince? Because the prince is a short book, but it's full of contradictions. It, it, it is perplexing. It requires interpretations, but often those interpretations are open-ending. So I, I don't claim that the interpretation that I bring forward in this class is the interpretation. It's just one of many. I try to explain the reasons why I think that interpretation is founded, is supported, uh, that it makes sense in several ways. And together we are working on this rather than picking derivative material from the internet. The same is true for the next assignment, the one due this Friday. And again, if you need more time, if you didn't buy assistance, just let me know, okay, before the deadline. But again, if you Google Robert Greene, if you Google 48 Laws of Power, you will find thousands of references. You will find articles, you will find blogs, you will find video interviews uh, with, with Green himself. So there is a lot that you can extract from the internet, but how relevant is it for our work? It's up to you to decide. Certainly, especially when it comes to the interviews, there are some interviews where Robert Green explains reasons, what inspired him, 
and how he structured his book, what the ideology of the book is. At the same time, Green himself, in every single interview, will, not, will never be limited just to the discussion of Machiavelli. He will always bring in other kinds of literature, other kinds of books, intellectuals, scholars. So it's easy to be hijacked from his uh, intellectual meanderings and end up in places that are not exactly pertinent for this class. So always try to stay within the confines, the parameters of our own exploration. And that is the nature of academic work. It doesn't mean that anything outside of what is presented in this class has no value. It just means that in order to be rigorous intellectually, we establish certain intellectual parameters. We establish a framework because that way we can go deeper into the evaluation of those ideas. And it doesn't mean that you have to agree with any of the ideas. I'm not trying to sell those ideas. I, I don't believe one should be Machiavellian. I'm not Machiavellian at all uh, in, in, in my life. I wished I was more Machiavellian. But again, it's just an intellectual examination that we're trying to conduct together. So keep in mind those parameters. By the way, the March 4th assignment on Robert Greene's laws of power should be placed, must be placed, exactly inside the same Google Docs file that you shared with me originally. That will be the file where you place any future assignments, there won't be many, and also the paper. Any draft of the paper that you want me to review and eventually, when everything is done, I will uh, uh, examine, read carefully your paper and leave there my comments and the grade for the paper. Also, keep in mind that the paper itself will be the basis, the foundation for your presentation that is part of the final grade, where you discuss what you found, discuss your findings. You have to show the ability of independently, uh, without reading, talking about your research, the, the, the kind of project that you uh, completed, okay? And it doesn't matter if it is not formally perfect, I want to see your mind at work. I want to see your active expertise uh, on this matter through a, a regular kind of conversation. Okay. So next, just briefly, when we watched The Godfather last Friday, I forgot to mention that we are uh, on time for the, uh, we were on time for the uh, uh, release, the new release of The Godfather uh, at the end of February. The Godfather was released in American theaters as well as in theaters around the world. For example, it was a big success in Italy during the last weekend. It was uh, the first or one of the first three movies uh, in terms of tickets that were sold. This is a restored copy. The original negative had been somewhat damaged because right away the movie attracted a lot of attention and they abused the negative, trying to uh, print too many originals from the negative. It was restored and I believe also, of course, they did something digitally I know that uh, at the end of this month, March, they will release uh, a, a 4K version, um, which is already on pre-order on Amazon. I don't know whether that, that is good or bad. In, in my mind, oftentimes, as, as a practitioner of, of cinema, oftentimes, a 4K version of a movie that but was had a beautiful photography, beautiful film, uh, uh, just exaggerates the contrast. Because apparently this is what uh, the viewer expects. Whereas there is nothing wrong in the graininess or, or slight fuzziness 
of film and, and you have some beautiful examples even in modern times for example Quentin Tarantino's Django which was shot in 70 millimeters and he wanted that exactly because of the quality of traditional photography as opposed to uh, digital photography so probably you'll notice the uh, acuity of, of the, the sharpness of the images but is that really a better version than the original because of that but other than that nothing was done apparently to the movie itself uh, I'm mentioning this because in 2019, Francis Ford Coppola had released a recut, re-edited version of The Godfather Part Three called The Coda, and, uh, and, and that included shortening some scenes, changing slightly the conclusion, etc. But nothing like that happened to The Godfather. I've included, just for your reference, some uh, passages from an article that the Hollywood Reporter had last Friday about the success of this film, even in the United States. And if you want, also, I added the link to a New York Times article. Okay, and as I said, the first assignment was corrected. These are the excerpts from The Princessa by Harry Rubin and I've marked some passages that I want to discuss with you today and then I'll continue next week as we did with Robert Greene although uh, for Robert Greene we had 1.25 classes the, the first class devoted to Robert Greene uh, was spent doing uh, something else again the purpose of this is to establish connections, comparisons, measure the distance or the closeness between this text and Machiavelli, his system in general, and specific passages as well, okay? So, uh, and, and by the way, I, I should mention that something about the, the author, Harry Rubin, is the author of several books, but her primary work and activity leading to the success of this book has always been in the publishing industry. And, and, and therefore she's worked in New York. I believe she might be from New Jersey, but I'm not completely sure. She was born in the 1950s. The, uh, at, at the top of the first page of the introduction, you find letter, right? And, and this idea of a letter is already kind of Machiavellian because there are some famous letters that are always mentioned about Machiavelli. We read one, the one from December 10, 1513, Machiavelli writing to his friend Francesco Vettori. In this case is letter from the Machiavella I have become. And this is curious in a way. It, it's worth uh, talking about this label. I've read and learned Machiavelli now I can call myself, rightfully, a Machiavella. And what I find interesting about this is that Machiavelli himself wrote The Prince and wrote other books. He also wrote plays, uh, short stories, where some elements, even in the literature, in the fictional works, some elements of his ideology can always be found. However, we have no indication at all, and, and we have plenty of documents about his life and uh, biographies, uh, some of which have been written as recent as the last 20 years, biographies of Machiavelli. So we, we have a lot of material about Machiavelli. Machiavelli was not Machiavellian. That's pretty much the consensus. It, it was um, an, an interesting uh, kind of man, full of irony, for sure. Um, but there is no indication that he was able to support his career or his attempts to be successful in life with his own ideology. He was an intellectual. There is an anecdote from the period which may or may not be true, but it's credible, uh, which shows Machiavelli at, 
at the end of the first decade of the 1500s, so a few years before the demise of his, of his uh, administrative career and employment with the Republic of Venice, uh, of Florence, uh, the anecdote describes Machiavelli in, outside of San Gimignano, which is one of the most beautiful towns you can visit in Tuscany. It's really magic, and you can still find the gate and the piazza outside of the walled city where Machiavelli uh, is found in this anecdote. And Machiavelli is there to coordinate the marching maneuvers of several military units. After all, his department was also involved with recruitment and training of soldiers for the Republic of Venice. So it's credible that he might have a hand or might be called to show his leadership in a more practical way. In this anecdote, Machiavelli has to issue orders so that these units move in this space harmoniously, right? And, and deploy in different ways, because after all, marching is, or, or used to be, when, when my friends were drafted in the Italian military, uh, marching is, is what they did a lot of, coordinated marching, and Machiavelli is there and he makes a mess of it. Is not able to uh, lead the troops the way a savvy orchestra director could. And this was used or invented around that time to show that Machiavelli, after all, might have pretended to know a lot about power, but it was just a goofy, awkward individual who had no direct experience of being a leader. And as I said, everything else we know about Machiavelli's life kind of confirm that impression. So in a way, it's a novelty to find someone who says, I'm Machiavelli, Ma Machiavelli, because Machiavelli himself was not a good model for his own system, okay? It's interesting also the rest of this uh, title that you find there, uh, the uh, Machiavella have become to the reader the princess of a travel in battle domain. And what I like more about the second part is, and you find another reference right here, Kingdom Run Amok, the perceptive reading by Harriet Rubin of Machiavelli, a lot of what you find in The Prince is the result of someone who's writing a book about politics and power during a critical time, during a time of crisis. Without that, without that understanding that Machiavelli's view of politics is heavily impacted, not just influenced, it's impacted by the crisis his own town and community was immersed in, you don't get really get his, the, the, the nature, the quality of his recommendations. And therefore, you fall into the usual trap of saying, well, Machiavelli advocated for evil, deceit, lies, etc. When in fact, those in his view were often, not always, but often, the correct responses to the extreme nature of the crisis that leaders of the time found themselves in the middle of a war that lasted in Italy, a series of wars that lasted about 60 years. And wars that were so dramatic, so relevant, that at the end of this 60 year period, any chance Italy might have had to remain independent, though fragmented, or become a nation, a unified nation, and any chances they had uh, were squashed and Italy could, all, could only start their own national unification compared to most other European countries 300 years later. It was only in 1861 that Italy, the first form of a kingdom of Italy comprising about two thirds of the peninsula was proclaimed, okay? So keep in mind this, it is an ideology for times of crisis, more than an ideology for times of positive change, construction, reform. And that is one of the explanations we give 
to the extreme natures of the recommendations given by Machiavelli, which are not meant to be universal laws of politics. Always lie, always do whatever it takes. No, it is within that context that certain practices can give you enough control over the outcome changing the circumstances, then different practices, different strategies that are not necessarily based on evil deceit will be necessary, even according to Machiavelli, if you understand Machiavelli's idea. So I like this idea that this, that Machiavelli is better suitable for critical situations than for creative and productive situations. Okay. And let's read together the first paragraph. Hi, Ruby talking to her reader. I have written this book for you, Princessa. Like Machiavelli's prince, you may be sitting alone somewhere safe, wanting to take control of your life, your loves, your problems. And I've underlined take control because that gives me a sense of her correct understanding of Machiavelli. Because one of the basic steps, one of the fundamental steps you have to take to understand Machiavelli is understand that Machiavelli, when he talks about power, power can have many manifestations, many incarnations. Power for Machiavelli is, in fact, control over a context. Now, the issues we'll face, of course, are twofold. As usual, Harriet Rubin, as a modern writer, cannot condone or invite to the reader to the use of, of, of force, of power in the forms of any kind of force, which is, is to be expected. And after all, even Machiavelli talks a lot about the deployment of force because he's talking about the highest forms of power, the control of government. And Machiavelli himself did not suggests that this exact system could be applied to the lives of individuals, even though we can gather some ideas to that effect from one of his successful plays, The Mandrake Root, where the characters involved use Machiavellian methods to get what they want, including some violence or purported violence, because in the end, the violence comes out to be fictional, but only some characters know it to be uh, a theater, a comedy in the comedy, so to speak. The other issue, and that is a major criticism that we can levy at Harry Rubin's book, is that there is a limited understanding of the fundamental truth that in Machiavelli, every law is limited to a context that there are no universal laws, that was it, what is true, what is acknowledged to be uh, the pathway to success in one context will cause complete ruin and failure in a different context. And instead, this book, like many other Machiavellian slash self-help books, implies that these are the rules, that uh, you can always do these things without differentiating between contexts, without emphasizing that success is the result of identifying a context, identifying what works in that context, and then also, because as we said on Monday, Machiavelli has a limited view of leadership, meaning not everyone can be a leader, even people with talents and skills will never become a leader if the talents they have to offer, the brand of leadership they have to, they have in themselves is not in demand, right? If, uh, take, uh, just, just to, to, to give some, some trivial example, take Winston Churchill in England in the 1930s, his career as a politician was, was really declining and then the war made him a leader and the perfect leader for that kind of situation, even with his shortcoming. And I don't know if you've ever seen The Dark Hour, for example. I recommend it. It's a beautiful film. And, and that emphasizes those shortcomings a lot. And then 1946 comes. 
the war is over and Churchill loses the election. He managed to guide England through the most critical time, right? 19, summer of 1940, England might have been inv invaded by Hitler and Hitler would probably have been successful with his invasion. And, and Churchill made England into a superpower, right? 1946 comes and is out. Uh, and he retires from, from politics, right? His leadership was a good fit for the time of war, but not for a time of peace. So this kind of understanding of the complex interaction of factors that lead to success is not really there or is only partially to be found in books such as this. But take control is something we like and we find Machiavellian. And, and then this addition as well, the way the young Florentine prince was desperate to take control of the kingdom run amok. This insistence on Machiavellian ide ideologies related to situations that are critical to applicable, more applicable to crisis than to the construction of something new. What I didn't like much about the last passage, at that moment Machiavelli appeared on the Medici palace scene to tell the prince stories and lessons of how the great Caesars and Spaniards and popes triumphed over similar wolves by fighting, <laughs> is that this reflects a very medieval view of the work of a political thinker or a historian. What is new, innovative about Machiavelli is exactly the fact that rather than just putting together a series of historical examples to be either imitated or avoided, Machiavelli uses the examples just as secondary material and reads every example in his own very peculiar way. So it's not the historical example that leads the way to the understanding of politics. Is, Machiavellian, is, is Machiavelli's radically new reading of politics, the political game, and history that allows him to rewrite and reread, reinterpret those examples. So it's not about storytelling. Oh, I'll tell you about Julius Caesar so that you can be Julius Caesar. It's much more than that. There is more of an intellectual operation that is conducted by Machiavelli on that historical material. So this is kind of a simplistic description. This book is about war. Again, the theme of Machiavelli being good for conflict, for crisis, that's fine. And of course, she has to add not the bloody kind because she has to say, well, I'm not like Machiavelli. I'm not saying you should kill your opponent or, or beat him up or uh, uh, wound him. Uh, but again, it's not like Machiavelli simply said, kill, beat your opponent, lie to your opponent, manipulate your opponent. Machiavelli said, within certain context, especially the critical kind, you might have to employ those means because those are the only instruments, the only strategies that will ensure your control over the outcome within that space and within the time that you have. And if you had more time or the context were to be different, you can find other strategies. You don't have to resort to violence as your primary instrument. It might be, in fact, detrimental. And the example I always give you to every class is that if Machiavelli had lived in our own media-dominated, digital media-dominated society, he would have recommended to limit violence and deceit as much as possible. Because especially during a time where the media are dispersed, because anyone with uh, a, a modicum of digital competence can open a free website and post articles pictures and expose a politician or turn on a camera on the phone and take a video of a politician doing something wrong in a society where politicians are surrounded by civilians who can document and circulate their malfeasance, 
then it doesn't pay really to be dishonest. Yeah, you, you can do that, but, and, and the examples of course are multiple from Gary Hart, who was excluded from the primaries uh, in the 1990s, to uh, plenty of examples in Italian politics of Italian politicians abusing their power for their private interest and being filmed by uh, regular citizens and these documents being circulated to impact in a negative way on their career. So fine, it's about war, it's about, she calls it the wars of intimacy, meaning uh, you have to be able, as an individual, as a woman in particular, you have to be able to navigate situations that require close contact with other individuals and a lot of, of, of subtle skills to come out on top. Uh, and it is about more as route to power. And, and again, yeah, uh, war, the deployment of power in order to ensure the outcome is what Machiavelli is about, but in a slightly more complicated way with influence and force and deterrence and authority and other uh, concepts being brought into the equation. Okay, and, and by conflict, I mean a particular kind of relationship. So this will be about being successful in society, being successful in the work environment etc. Is, is this some understanding of the concept of context in a way? So again, we're not evaluating these texts with a rigid grid where we say check mark yes or no. Uh, in, in this case it's kind of fuzzy and in other passages there is some understanding that there is always a context in which you deploy your uh, means of power, but it's not as complex an idea as you find in Machiavelli. There is the understanding that when you take a context, not in general, but when you take a specific context, then the amount of control each player in this context, each active player in this context has, is part of a finite amount. And if I have more, someone will have less and vice versa within that context. As I said, it's important to understand that if you take society as a totality, then you can imagine a kind of political program where the more power people have and the more power the whole of society has. But in a context, Machiavelli is right, there is only a finite amount of power and control. In every encounter, one person always has more command over the situation than the other. And as I said, if, if you think of a context that is often accurate and may contest you for the things you want. If you lose, you lose your struggle to have a better, fairer, nobler and sweeter life. So a Machiavellian game is basically a win-lose kind of game. And again, I don't mean to imply that every social or political game should be that way. Politics can be a win-win game. It depends on the scale. It depends on the situation. But when, it, when you examine specific contexts, well-defined context within the space and the limited time that context is in place, the boundaries of that context are kept intact then there is only a certain amount of control that can be exercised and it is a win or lose kind of situation. For the next uh, page and a half, uh, Harriet Rubin goes into the description of an episode that inspired her book where she finds herself in the company of a few uh, girlfriends in a bar in San Francisco and they say, look, we are successful managers, uh, we can negotiate multi-million dollar deals, we are rich, we are elegant, uh, we are apparently in control of our lives, and yet we don't have that much power, right? There is a lot of things that we are not doing for ourselves. We do bring success to our companies, but we don't do, we don't bring as much success 
to our own uh, lives, individual lives. And why is that? And she goes into trying to explain and provide a solution. So, for example, she says women have had no language for the fight, meaning the mindset of women is not geared to confrontational conflicts. We have not been able to express our desire for power. And you find here some of the concepts that were common in feminism around the end of the 20th century. I added the M for Machiavelli to these passages because I do find a strong connection here when she says, what is my authority? Why should you believe me, you, the reader of this book? Well, similarly to Machiavelli, who claims to have had experience and direct exposure to some of the leaders, for example, there is a famous reference Machiavelli introduces at the end of chapter seven, where after talking about Cesare Borgia and his father, the Pope Alexander VI, their maneuvers, their political maneuvers, their political and military campaigns, then Machiavelli says, and Cesare Borgia once told me that he had thought of everything, but he didn't know that his father would be dead uh, in that particular situation. So Machiavelli places himself on the scene as someone that a leader as famous or infamous, notorious, such as Cesare Borgia was, would uh, have an exchange, a meaningful exchange with. So it's kind of saying, these are my credentials. I could entertain uh, conversations about problems and solutions with someone as famous as Cesare Borgia. And Harry Rubin says, well, I, as, as a higher level manager, I got to meet a lot of CEOs, business leaders, and I studied them, uh, and, and they explained how they made their fortune, etc. Okay, so it is a Machiavellian move to establish your authority based on experience, and, and experience is really important and relevant for Machiavelli. Of course, Machiavelli would also introduce a, a, another nuance to this kind of uh, reasoning. That is to say that you don't necessarily learn from another successful leader because what made them successful in the contexts they operated might not make you successful now that the context is different. The times have changed, society has have changed, etc. Which is the reason why, yes, you can buy as many books, uh, memoirs or books about the various Bill Gates, Warren Buffett, etc. It doesn't mean that you will be, and Dave Carnegie who, who started this genre, it doesn't mean that you will be successful because they had circumstances that matched their skills, and your skills may be different, your circumstances may be different, uh, etc. Certainly, you cannot create another Microsoft because Bill Gates found himself in a situation where he uh, just improvised in response to a need for an operating system and made his success in a way uh, that, that combined his managerial skills, because he basically bought the operating system from someone else and then sold it to IBM, and also the very specific circumstances in which he operated, okay? And he didn't have another Microsoft to fight against. Then, of course, you find another feminist or pseudo-feminist claim, unless we learn to take for ourselves, we are doomed to be princessa in hiding forever, not governed in a palace, but trapped in the palace bar, protected by our failure. And this is part of the self-help ideology, right? A self-help book is based on the premise, read this book, follow these rules, you'll be successful. By definition, success is not something that everyone can have, unless you're talking about the success of, um, being a mature, grown-up, 
a, a more spiritual person, unless you're talking about successes that you can achieve in the context of your own psyche, spirit, mind. If you're talking about society, uh, right? Not everyone can become Bill Gates by definition, right? It's not how the economy works, but that's the promise and the premise upon which Safa books are uh, uh, sold and uh, the, the, the most, the simplest statement you can make about these books is if these books worked, they wouldn't be selling new books about self-help in six months or a year, etc. right? So you're basically selling the dream of uh, being successful. Although, as I said, there are plenty of books where you can find ways to make yourself better, okay? So you, you fight for your success, for your life, for your happiness, right? This is not about politics, that's clear. And she adds a uh, nice statement by Diane Arbus, learn not to be careful, which I find very Machiavellian when she says careful is safe, peaceful, and on the sidelines of action. Well, Machiavelli himself, as much as he was a philosopher, an intellectual, an educated humanist, in the end, he will say, even in The Prince, at the end of The Prince, he will say, no matter how good or bad, right or wrong, your strategy is act, do something, don't wait. And that is connected to this idea that I introduced before that Machiavelli's ideology was born out of a critical time. And therefore, you can understand that at the end of his logical or quasi-logical explanations, Machiavelli will say, well, keep in mind what I told you, forget what I told you, though, and act. Because if you don't act, nothing will change. Because, of course, he's talking from the point of view of someone who's living, who's in the middle of this period of 60 years of wars, and who is eager for his town, his community, Italy all together to find a solution no matter what. And exactly as a man of the Renaissance, he's always on the side of doing, acting, rather than on the side of thinking, meditating, philosophizing, okay? So he's a very pragmatic kind of individual and someone who has an understanding of time, meaning that a solution has to be found within a certain time frame. After time has gone by, then even the best solution will not work. And Machiavelli often relies on medical metaphors and references to medicine, to the idea, for example, that you may have the right diagnosis and you may have at your disposal the right kind of treatment, the right kind of medication, but if you don't apply it in time, at the right time, the patient will die because there is a, a threshold past which the patient's body cannot be healed even with the correct kind of treatment. And that's why Machiavelli will always say, err on the side of action, not on the side of caution. Don't be uh, uh, cautious, overly uh, cautious. And that's why we will find at the end of The Prince famous passages where Machiavelli praises the uh, uh, inclinations of youth, the, uh, uh, na the, the natural predisposition of younger individuals in society to be impetuous, to be passionate, and to get engaged and find a solution rather than acting like an older and wiser man. Because during this time, there is this clear social and biological uh, uh, understanding of uh, the ages where the youngest are in passionate and impetuous and throw caution to the wind and the older individuals or anyone who ages past a certain age becomes slower, more cautious, takes more time to act, is more prone to reflection and to philosophy in general. And Machiavelli, even though was not 
that young when he wrote The Prince takes the side of the younger people because that's the side of action. Doing something, even something wrong, better than just waiting because waiting will bring you no real benefit. Waiting means sometimes that you wait so long that no good solution can be applied any longer to a critical situation. So I very much find this uh, statement from Diane Arbus re-proposed by Harry Rubin to be aligned with Machiavellian thinking. Not so much the next one for the reasons I explained at the beginning. That night, the night of the bar, I decided to step into Machiavelli's shoes to apply all that I learned finally to my own benefit because Machiavelli was never able to apply his rules to his life and make his life uh, come out of a slump. Uh, during the 1520s, between 1520 and 1526, Machiavelli was hired and uh, um, it paid uh, to perform different roles for the uh, Medicis, from quasi-official historian of Florence to diplomat, but the diplomatic mission he was engaged with were minor, really low-level diplomatic missions. Uh, they were often difficult, but with, with no glory, because he was not sent to deal with the leaders of the time. He was sent to deal with, with provincial leaders, or in one case, the head of a convent who was rebellious against the Medici. How important can the abbot of, of a convent in a Tuscan town be, really? So Machiavelli himself was not really Machiavellian. I will teach you more, again, a reference to Machiavellian ideology for a time of crisis that is uh, good, of course. Um, I'll, I'll just continue for a minute and then I will stop. This might be interesting, it's difficult to say, but when I read everything is born in war, there is no shame in fighting, etc. A connection with Machiavelli's ideologies can be, can, can be found because after all, Machiavelli based some of his advice and recommendations on a certain understanding of what nature is, the nature of man, the nature of society. And he often thought of society as a biological body where certain reactions, certain impulses that you find in the masses follow regular trends. Right? And one of the things he applied to this kind of reasoning was the idea that a leadership must be able to enforce boundaries in society to make citizens honest, which gives you a different understanding of the so-called endorsement of evil by Machiavelli. Yes, the prince might be called to be evil in certain situations. However, one of the missions that are vital to the government the good government of a state for the prince is to make sure that citizens comply with the laws, whether they want to or not. Combined with the understanding based on Aristotelian ethics that if you force someone to behave, to respect the laws, to respect the social rules, day in and day out for many years, then even if they don't want to, if, if, even if they were not honest by, by nature, they'll turn into what they practice. That actions will make citizens into honest members of their community, if, even if they act out of fear of punishment or retaliation. So, Sooner or later, when you travel the Machiavellian universe, you find some positive values. Whether the Machiavellian paths to those good things are correct or the only solution, it's, it's okay, you, you can uh, disagree with this, I, I hope you do. But you do find, if you stay with Machiavelli long enough, that it's not exactly about supporting or advocating evil practices in politics.